Hi everybody, my name is Griffin Bridgers. It's my pleasure to present today a view of Estate of Morissette versus Commissioner Parts 1 and 2. These tax court cases from 2016 and 2021 dealt with the same sets of facts, but with different tax issues involved in each. But as we're going to see, they tie together to give us some ironic lessons that have been learned. As always, I want to remind you that this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. So, what was involved in the Morissette cases? Well, these can be broken down into Morissette 1 and Morissette 2, but both cases had valuable nuggets about tax planning for split dollar agreements, which I'll give you a brief overview of in a second. But really what these cases dealt with are specifically the gift and the estate tax consequences, respectively, of split dollar agreements. Now, split dollar agreements can be pretty confusing to begin with, and these opinions in, in the estate of Morissette cases can be quite lengthy and confusing as well. So my hope is that today we can break these down and look at Morissette 1 briefly, which looked at the gift tax consequences of split dollar arrangements, and Morissette 2, which analyzed the estate tax consequences of split dollar arrangements. So, what are split dollar arrangements? Well, I may butcher this here, but the general idea or premise is that split dollar is used in a situation or somebody else advances the premiums for life insurance on another person's life, and in so doing, retains a right to be paid back in full or in part for those premiums that have been advanced. Oftentimes, you see this pop up in an employment context where maybe an employer buys life insurance on an employee's life and advances the premiums as an added benefit, but retains the right to be paid back from the death benefit for those premiums that have been advanced if and when the employee passes away. And these premiums that are advanced are often treated as compensation to the employee at the time of death. Then for non-employees, the premiums that are advanced may be treated as gifts. So as you can see, there's some tax consequence here. Now, does it make sense to have to pay back previously taxed income or some previously taxed benefit dollar for dollar? Probably not. So the idea here is that when the insured employer donee dies, the death benefit will be used to pay back some of those premiums at least, but without necessarily a corresponding dollar for dollar offset. If there was a dollar for dollar offset, this would be more along the lines of a loan. However, in this case, oftentimes you may be limited to a smaller amount, at least in terms of the upfront uh, uh, cost that is actually taxed to the employee or to the donee. So these amounts don't perfectly correspond, and that's really what was at issue in both Morissette 1 and 2. So in brief, the Morissette cases involved three brothers who were the succeeding generation in a family business, which we know as interstate van lines. Now, there was a stated goal within the family, a stated desire to keep the business in the family, to not have to sell it to outside parties or take on outside investment. But there was also some infighting among the brothers in terms of how that was going to be done and even what their role was day to day in the business or how much stock they owned. So down the road, knowing that this uh, transition from generation to generation was happening and knowing that there could be also some estate tax issues inherent in the value of the business at their mother's passing, the brothers coordinated a plan where their trustees of their late mother's revocable trust, who was living at the time of this transaction, and also conservators for her as well. And they set up a, a series of life insurance policies, six cash value life insurance policies, each with a death benefit of about $10 million. These were owned in irrevocable dynasty trusts that were set up, one for each brother. And the mother's revocable trust advanced $30 million in premiums for these policies that had 60 million in death benefits combined. And in this case, they set up three split dollar agreements, one for each brother, that were set up to pay back the mother's revocable trust for the lesser of the premiums paid or the cash value of the policies if and when a brother passed away. So, 
There are several lessons we learn in these more set cases. And lesson one is going to be that in a split dollar agreement that follows the economic benefit regime, the only gift is the cost of current life insurance protection. This was what was at issue in Morissette 1. There is a Treasury Regulation 1.61-22 which governs split dollar agreements. And this allows you to treat split dollar not necessarily as a loan, but maybe as uh, an advance of some premiums which may be taxed, but may not have to be paid back in full using what's known as the economic benefit regime. So really, the economic benefit regime says that only the cost of current life insurance protection that's paid by an employer or donor will be subject to gift or income tax, as long as the donor can receive the lesser of the following amounts at the insured's death under the split dollar agreement, either the total premiums paid, or if less, the cash value of the policies. So really what this does is it allows for cash value buildup over time without some level of immediate taxation or a perfect dollar for dollar loan with interest. And in Morissette 1, this regime was respected for gift tax purposes, mainly because there was one key fact. This treasury regulation applies for gift tax purposes, but it treats the mother's revocable trust in this case as the party advancing the premiums as if it's the deemed owner of the life insurance policies. So because of this, the 30 million in cash value wasn't gifted away. Instead, only the cost of current life insurance protection was actually gifted away to the three dynasty trusts, which were the actual owners on paper of the policies. So this allowed for a huge gift tax savings there was only a taxable gift of 600000 for oh, close to $30 million in premiums that had been advanced. Now, just because you get away with things on the gift tax front doesn't mean you're going to get away with them on the estate tax front. Which brings us to lesson two. This economic benefit regime we just looked at does not apply for estate tax purposes. If you get a benefit one way, you're not necessarily going to get a benefit the other way. So what was at issue in Morissette 2 was really the amount that the mother's revocable trust was owed back for these premiums that had been advanced upon her passing. And her passing happened three years after these split dollar agreements were set up. Now, if you ignore the split dollar agreements, the question is, can you look through those to say that the full cash value of the policies or the full premiums paid are what sh what is subject to estate tax? And the answer is not necessarily because the big thing here is that all she's retained is the right to be paid back some amount in her revocable trust down the road if one of the brothers passes away. And all three survived their mother, and really what you're doing is looking at the fact that there's no immediate payout down the road. Her trust might get paid back $30 million, but we have no idea when that might happen or if that might happen. So given this reality, although the regulation that we cited in Morissette 1 ease this gift tax burden by using the economic benefit regime, the actual words of the regulation say that it only applies to the income tax and the gift tax. It doesn't apply to the estate tax. So ultimately, Morissette 2 rejected this reasoning in Morissette 1 for the estate tax issue, which leads to our first real ironic lesson here that although the gift and estate taxes are unified, this unified this unification on its surface doesn't necessarily apply to split dollar arrangements. But there is a benefit here which may take some of that irony out, because recall the whole reason they got that gift tax benefit is because the mother's revocable trust had been the deemed owner of the policies for gift tax purposes under the split dollar uh, treasury regulation. Now, the fact that the mother's revocable trust is not the deemed owner for estate tax purposes is what helps here because it means that possibly you could get a discount, you're valuing a split dollar receivable and not the full cash value of the policies. In other words, the split dollar agreement is being respected. But that brings us to lesson three is that split dollar arrangements or agreements are respected for estate tax purposes when motivated by valid business purposes. So what the IRS wanted to do out of the gate was essentially ignore the split dollar agreements under code sections 2036, 2038, and 2073. Really, they claimed that the trustee of the mother's revocable trust had retained the right to terminate the split dollar agreements in connection with the trustee of the dynasty trust. There was a mutual termination provision that made these agreements 
problematic. And in the eyes of the IRS, that was enough to say, hey, since the mother's revocable trust had retained this right, it's as if she were still the owner of the policies and these split dollar agreements should be disregarded. So the question is, what are we valuing? And if we, va we, if we ignore the split dollar agreements, all we're doing is valuing the policies for estate tax purposes. But the brothers successfully argued that these code sections don't apply if you can establish a bona fide sale for adequate consideration, which is exactly what they did. The central fact was that there was a desire a stated desire across multiple generations to keep the business in the family. So it had gone on for a long time that this had been their stated desire and the ethos among the entire family's series of estate plans. And it helped too that the brothers weren't getting along. There was no presumption that they were going to act in concert with each other to try to pull a fast one and get some huge tax benefit. They were essentially at odds. So really three things established this bona fide sale to avoid these code sections. One, there was a valid non-tax business reason for the split dollar agreements in terms of keeping the business in the family and creating liquidity in case uh, there was an estate tax liability at the mother's death. There was also adequate consideration. Now keep in mind, as I said earlier, the split dollar agreements don't give you a perfect dollar for dollar offset. But what the tax court found is that there can be non-monetary adequate consideration, such as the intangible benefit you get from keeping the business in the family and furthering that intent. And it also helped that these were split dollar agreements, which you see used as compensation arrangements in a lot of different contexts. So because of this, there were comparable terms, specifically this mutual termination provision, um, when comparing these split dollar agreements to others that were entered into uh, maybe by public and private companies out there. And what the brothers argued is that they were tenured senior executives and in that position, they might demand a mutual termination provision in their split dollar agreements and the tax court agreed. So what that meant is that what we're valuing now is just the split dollar receivable instead of the policies. But our next ironic outcome is that the Morissette estate got hammered on this valuation issue, which brings us to lesson four. What happens to the split dollar agreement after the death of the donor counts when it comes to valuing the receivable. So again, the entire value proposition here is that the revocable trust had advanced close to $30 million in premiums, and the cash value of the policies at the mother's death was $32.6 million. But we wanted a discount below this total amount. However, for that discount to hold up, there has to be some certainty that the split dollar agreements will stay in place and continue to be respected by the heirs who receive them, in the, this case, the brothers. And the tax court wasn't convinced that this would be the case, mainly because the terms of the mother's revocable trust distributed the split dollar agreements to each brother's uh, dynasty trust after her death. And that's a bit of a typo here. It should say each brother's irrevocable dynasty trust. So the big question here is if you owed a note to yourself, would you pay it? Probably not. And that's the way the tax court and the IRS viewed these split dollar agreements is that once they went into each brother's trust, the merger doctrine would apply where you have the same party on both sides of the transaction. So there's no reason to respect that arrangement from then on. So what happened is that this almost wiped out the valuation discount completely. That brings us to our final lesson that some discounts are so large as to be unbelievable and even encouraging an independent quote unquote appraiser to increase the valuation can make it even less believable. So ultimately, the brothers and the IRS here were very far apart. And ultimately, not only did the Morissette estate almost lose the entire discount, as we just saw, but they also got hammered with, in addition to an estate tax of 40% on the underpayment, they also got hammered with a penalty of 40% of that estate tax underpayment for a gross valuation misstatement. Now, keep in mind that penalty is 40% of the 40% of the lost discount. You can do the math separately, but ultimately facts mattered here. The brothers had reported an appraised value of only seven and a half million on their mother's estate tax return as the value of the split dollar receivable. 
in exchange for close to $30 million in premiums that had been advanced. That's almost a 75% discount. Now, long story short, you can avoid this gross valuation misstatement penalty if you can show reasonable good faith reliance on an appraiser. But the tax court said, one, there's no way the brothers could have believed that this appraisal was reasonable. It gave a 75% discount, which is well beyond the bounds of any discount that the IRS typically accepts. And further, there couldn't have been good faith reliance on this appraiser because there was a question of how independent that appraiser truly was. Because ultimately, the brothers and the mother's estate planning attorney had received a first draft of the appraisal and then turned around and made their own edits and encouraged the appraiser to increase the discount after reviewing that first draft. So brothers lost on valuation and lost on penalty, which brings us to our concluding irony here, which is that taxpayers rarely prevail on arguments under code sections 2036, 2038, and 2073. And the more set brothers here did they prevailed on those arguments, but then they got hammered on the back end on the valuation of the split dollar receivables and the penalties that attach to their gross valuation understatement. Which brings us to our concluding remark, and forgive my singing here, but tax law has a funny way of sneaking up on you. It also has a funny, funny way of helping you out helping you out which if you're uh, familiar with Alanis Morissette's popular tune ironic from 1995 you recognize the lyrics as always if you have questions or topic suggestions you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com with the caveat that I cannot give tax or legal advice in response to your questions. But I thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope it brought you some clarity around the Morissette cases and split dollar agreements in general. And I look forward to seeing you in my future content.